Good afternoon. This is the <laughs> County Board of Commissioners uh, meeting for the budget, finance audit and budget committee. I'm Commissioner Sharon, Sharon Barnes Sutton and I chair this committee. The members of the committee are Commissioner Larry Johnson and Commissioner Elaine Boyer who will be joining us shortly. Yes, coming Okay. So the first item that we can look at, while we're waiting for Commissioner Boyd, you just going to get the minutes out of the way. Uh, the minutes are on, not available. So I'll put them on there in case they will be, but they are not. Sorry. Okay, <coughs> got to skip that then. Discussion 2014 budget process. Okay, who's going to lead that discussion? Well, um, Commissioner, I just want to. Actually, the, the interim CEO will lead the discussion, but I will just make a point of there was a series of questions that were asked at the last meeting that we'll be providing written responses to. Yes. Uh, and those will be delivered to us prior to the conclusion of this meeting. Okay. And Hello, the, everyone. <laughs> uh, well, just, just uh, say it again. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to uh, open up uh, today, we want to do uh, uh, a couple of things uh, to help kind of inform uh, the, the budget conversation. And one, we brought our tax assessor in, Mr. Calvin Hicks. I uh, would love to uh, have him come forward by permission of the chair to, to discuss what he's seeing out there in terms of the digest and the realities of our economy right now and, and uh, what's, you know, from his professional opinion where he thinks uh, we're going to end up. He's not prepared to put any concrete, you know, numbers forward and he doesn't want his feet to be held to the fire right now so we can, you know, do, as they continue to do their work to certify the digest. But I thought it would be helpful for this discussion as well. And then the second thing, uh, we have uh, our chief of police and uh, uh, and our fire from somewhere around He's here. here. He's ready. Okay, we're, oh, sorry. <laughs> Looking for the other <laughs> I couldn't see fast paper. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so they're going to talk about the, uh, the continued pressing needs in police and fire because, as we've all talked about, we want to make sure that we have adequate staffing levels and providing them with the needs that they have to be, uh, with the resources that they need to be uh, successful. And then, um, then I'll look back around uh, after completion. Uh, Okay. Just one point of order, Madam Chair, just to let you know if we needed the marshal, I think he came by. If you need any further questions, I just want to let you acknowledge he was here. Okay. Chair, all my department heads are here for that very same reason. Okay, so Mr. Hicks. Thank you. Good afternoon. As, as uh, the interim field indicated, we are not yet complete with our work. As a matter of fact, we're very early still into that process. Uh, we will not have our database of sales completely entered from GIS probably until the close of this month. So uh, I'm not in a position to tell you based on market activity that we have personally analyzed uh, what type of, of digest growth we will anticipate since 2014. I think generally uh, if you look at the, the indicators values are, are going up. They, they're appreciating up. One of the things that, that I have, have, have done is, okay, well, can we look at some type of independent source and get an idea of, of what's, what's happening? This is data that we do not control, but it may be able to give us an indication of what's happening in the marketplace. So these spreadsheets that I have passed out uh, do several things. They commence with the 2013 digest totals. Uh, you got an extra one? Okay. Here, here, here. They, they oh, commence. Sure. No, no, you good. You good. You got it? Yes, yep. sir. They commenced with the 2013 Digest totals. The Digest at the point in time they were submitted. Um, the Digest each year is a con continually, uh, it's, it's a document that, that continually is updated. If you look at the 2013 digest today, the values are about a half percent less than what they were at the point in time that we submitted the digest. That's because as you move through the appeal process, you have changes in the, in the values and you have some discoveries that occur as well. So 2013 digest numbers submitted to where we are today is roughly a half percent below. 
Zillow is a is a, a company that tracks market activity, real estate sales specific to residential uh, sales. What I've looked at is to see what sort of growth do they anticipate year over year for DeKalb County, and that number is 16.9%. And also, they are able to display the data by the various municipalities. And so on the spreadsheet that you have, you're looking at digest totals for the various municipalities and it starts with the unincorporated. The unincorporated actually in this instance is taken to be everything uh, that, that is unincorporated and, and then we sort of sum that minus the municipalities that, that are, are listed. If you look at the Zillow data, it, it gives you different uh, appreciation rates from January 1 of 13 to January 1 of 14. Uh, one of the, the things that we did in, in our presumptions, this is, this is just in, in, in looking at creating a, a model, was to say, okay, let's not take those, those uh, values at face value. Uh, so the first thing we did was in, in applying the percentage of appreciation that Zillow recorded is to allow a 20% discount. So we're basically taking 80% of the number that uh, Zillow has, and we're starting there. We've applied that adjustment only to the residential property. So we went into the digest, pulled out only the residential component, assuming that the commercial component, uh, all other components, personal property, motor vehicles, et cetera, would remain static. And then what we're trying to do is, is, is try to, to, to ensure that, that the view we take is somewhat conservative. When, when you look at that, when you look at all of the county, the number that Zillow uh, has based on those, that premises of making a 20% discount and starting with our values as they were in 2013, Zillow says roughly that. that's, that's about a 7% increase in value you can anticipate. But I caution you, that 7% has to be taken with a grain of salt. Number one, not every parcel in DeKalb County has been exposed for sale, nor, nor would it be, be uh, reasonable to assume that it's going to be exposed for sale within one period of time. The data that Zillow is, is reporting on reflects only those sales that were in the marketplace and, and, and actually you've got completed transactions on. So that's, that's number one. As we begin to look at our data, if we are looking at a neighborhood and that neighborhood has had very little market activity, because usually your market activity is not uniform. You'll have one area that's very hot, you've got a lot of activity that's going on out there. You may have an older, mature area somewhere, and you have no sales out there. So uh, I have to caution you that you really can't take that 7% and, say, and run with it and say, yeah, it's going to be 7% on all the property in DeKalb County. I think we can say, based on the sales that have occurred over the last year time frame, those sales indicate that that was generally a 7% increase, or would be a 7% increase in the digest. Uh, again, we're, we're reflecting only the residential component, but we're then pushing it back into the digest to see what overall, what were the digest uh, totals, how would they respond. Uh, so the, the spreadsheet that you have indicates for the municipalities, it indicates for the counties as, uh, for the uh, county as a whole. Uh, that's a number of roughly starting at 7%. I think the uh, CEO had, had indicated that you wanted some sort of breakdown between the, the, the municipalities, I believe. So we tried to accommodate yeah, that. Who's, who's CEO? Oh, oh, we don't have one. Who's Pardon? Exactly. Who's CEO? I apologize, maybe yeah, I got sick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Williams. Okay. Mr. Zachary. Zachary. Mr. Zachary Williams, who is the younger one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, given that, that the data is, is a third party data, but, but that in itself is, 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 is good from this perspective. This isn't data that we've had an uh, opportunity or, or ability to manipulate. It is whatever the market reflects based on Zillow's data. Uh, Zillow goes into great detail to give you an overview in terms of what's happening overall in the county. And, and I think there's some very good positive things that are happening. You can't necessarily just look at the year over year increase in value and say, oh, that, that's an indication of what's happening in, in the county as a whole. Because we have areas, for instance, where there still is um, an inventory of pre-foreclosure properties that are, that are out there, people that, that are still in some, some distress that ultimately are going to come into the marketplace 
and they're going to have an influence. Uh, you look at the number of people who are behind on the, the mortgages. That's an indication of the health or, 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 of an area as well, as well as the number of individuals who, when you look at their, their current mortgages uh, and the current values on that property, how do they relate? And we still have a large percentage of people that are underwater. The, the 2013 digest certainly was substantially lower than, say, the 2008 digest by about $5 billion, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, so there's a lot of ground that still has to be made up before we, we get back to uh, the level of value that was there before the most recent economic decline. Again, these are Zillow numbers, but, but I would consider them to be probably the, the cheeriest of observations. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, that's probably somewhere around 6.5%. Personally, uh, I think the six and a half is going to be high. I, I think some some have asked me where I think we're going to end up, and I, I think it's probably going to be around the three three percent range. Maybe I'm conservative. I don't know. Maybe I like my job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, I've like tried to provide you with the data mm -hmm. it, it, that that sort of sets the the upper range that that's there, and 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 provide you with some some information that will will support that. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, can you go to this page the year over year? Yes, sir. Is that, that's what I'm, am I reading it correctly? The Y O Y? Year over year? Yes, sir. And I see a lot of positives here. And I'm just looking at Candler and McAfee in my area. That's uh, That means growth is is growing. That's right. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, the only only negative number that I see is for the area that's identified as Belvedere. Right. And you but, see that, but that's, that's not actually a loss in a loss in value, a, a negative amount. If, if you saw the very first one, Dunwood is at the top of that mm -hmm. year over year. Uh, basically, what this report is indicating is that time frame January 1, 2013 to January 1, 2014. The sales indicate there's been a 14.45% increase in value in, in the Dunwood area. And, and as you read down, the, the, the next one is North Atlanta, and it indicates a 19.82% increase in value in, in there. You, you see there is some variation. Uh, Stone Mountain Fences shows 18.56%, uh, et cetera. Now, Numbers are wonderful things, and, and they can sort of give you a different indication of what's going on. But but I assure you, if you look at, say, Dunwood and, and, and Stone Mountain, the typical house in, in, in Dunwood is over $300,000. Mm -hmm. The typical house in Stone Mountain is under $100,000. So it's not really apples to apples. And and, and there's been, been a much greater decline in the Stone Mountain area than there has in, in the Dunwoody area. So you, you sort of have to take these numbers with with uh, uh, a caveat. Okay, what's going on in Scottsdale? <laughs> <laughs> 31, I was like, what's Scottsdale, going on? Scottsdale, 31 percent. If, if you looked at, at the decline so in Scottsdale, <laughs> those numbers were, were, were near the floorboard. Mm -hmm. In terms of values, had, they were so depressed. Right. So, so yes, you're seeing some increase there now, but, but, but again, they're already. still gonna, uh, are going to be well below what they were in 2008. What the mm -hmm. was done. But, but, the, the markets don't don't react in, in a uniform manner. Mm -hmm. You all represent different areas of the county, mm -hmm. and every area you represent is different from another. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it goes without saying that some of the, the more, more recent law changes that we have had have had a, 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 a terrible consequence. The, 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 like the uh, foreclosure? Uh, well, like foreclosures because, well, it's not only a foreclosure. We, we, we've had a, uh, it's volume, the, the activity, the number of foreclosures that the gap has experienced. But when you change the law that says a foreclosure, which heretofore was not taken to be an arm's length transaction, mm -hmm. and you say when the bank sells that property, you're going to take that as evidence of market value. Now typically banks don't sell their mm -hmm. properties at market what value. value. Mm -hmm. they, they typically sell in the very low oh, yeah. range of value. So when you, you're having properties that sell in the low range of value and you're being told you've got to consider those as if they are market value, it, it deflates the value of everything else in that area. And, and it, it doesn't take, it's not a very difficult thing to see. If you're in a neighborhood and, and you have maybe one foreclosure, in all likelihood that one foreclosure has no impact on, on your 
market right. marketability of your property. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a neighborhood and everything you see is, is an REO property that's being sold at a below Low market, market value, uh, the chances of you being able to, to expose your property on the market for what you consider sure. to be a reasonable price and get someone to buy it for that, it, it's not going to happen. And, and you have a whole host of things that go mm -hmm. along. We, we have changes in the statute that say if somebody buys that foreclosure now, an awful lot of these REO properties and the foreclosures is just the next step. The REO is the next step when the bank right. is taking it. Mm -hmm. When that property is acquired, that has to be taken as evidence of market value. Even if they go in and renovate the property, because a lot of these properties have been vandalized, etc. Unless they go in and change the footprint, we are required to hold the value at what it was acquired at. Unless we can get the owner to say, I believe the work I did was a major renovation. And we have to get them to agree to that. Now, if there is a change in the footprint, or the, the, that, that's a different scenario. But but properties that have been broken into, vandalized, replacing windows, doors, heating, uh, air conditioning equipment, carpet, all of that is, is, is a renovation work that we don't get to address, even though it may have occurred during the year. Mm -hmm. When we look at that sale, it's whatever it was acquired for. And mm -hmm. not includes making $100,000 worth of improvements. Right. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Johnson. Just one thing, uh, Commissioner Gannon and I was noticing on a lot of these unredeemed and properties that we're putting on our agenda to sell, mm -hmm. we're getting the same investor who's buying up these properties. So I just don't want people to get a false sense of security. We had a finite group of people who are buying up mm -hmm. large groups of homes mm -hmm. for rental purposes, right. not Pretty necessarily right. to sell. And so I think we're on a crash course with something else. Uh, that we, I know when I first moved here, we had a lot of investors who were buying up property, but a lot of the crash happened. But we had people who had oversaturated and bought all these homes but couldn't sell them. And they say, a lot of the same people, not saying these these folks that are buying now are doing it, but now the same group is popping back up buying homes that were basically went in the ground. Now you're buying them cheaper, you know, and you're buying large groups of these homes. So now you have whole areas who will become rentals as opposed to these are not homeowners. So mm -hmm. in terms of trying to put it innovation or trying to put improvements in, it's gonna be very minimal because they're trying to suck as much of that rent <coughs> as they can. Also, I don't know if you, if that's, you can't take that into consideration, but I don't want to set up a false sense of security because no, you, people are not really, people are buying, but it may be like 10% buying 50% of these homes as opposed to each individual homeowner used to buy, buy the house and stay in the house. But you got people who are buying the house and they're running their houses. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a legitimate observation. A couple of things happen now from a social economic standpoint. Uh, an area that's developing and originally when the houses are built, uh, it's 300000 and above. And then you go through one of these market corrections and the bank ends up with a few of them and all of a sudden if the bank's selling them for less than hundred thousand dollars you change the economic uh social uh demographics of that area because the people who were there who could afford a three hundred thousand dollar house typically are not the same who can afford a hundred thousand dollar house so you you bring some disruption in, in into the community uh the, the investors is an in, interesting observation because uh, a lot of these banks now prefer to deal with an investor. They, they will, will put a, a, a mm -hmm. group of these, these things together. And even the individual homeowner, or someone who wants to be the individual homeowner, can't, can't be against be them. Either. Because the banks would prefer to sell many yeah. at one time, <laughs> as, as opposed to <laughs> one, at time. Time. one at a time. So, so you have all of these things that sort of play out in the marketplace, uh, but, but the, from our perspective, the thing that, that is a negative is when you have legislation that says you have to consider that as evidence of market value. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that has contributed greatly to the decline in, in value that we've experienced in the past. See ya. Mr. Hicks, if you could just talk about the amount of activity that you're still seeing in terms of sheer numbers of REOs or foreclosed homes compared to, to where it's been. But they are down. Uh, the, the, when you look at, at percentage of, of activity, that, that's the kind that they are declining, and that is refreshing because uh, as as the the composition of REO properties in the marketplace diminishes, 
typically the more typical uh, thought to be more typical arms um, that transactions will occur and you should have a stabilization of values and I think to some extent that's, that's happening that's evidence now that in every area of, of the cap counter we are seeing some appreciation uh, again minimizing the number of, of all your properties that that are available in the marketplace will diminish the, the direct impact they have on everything else that remains so as we move forward, I would anticipate that the values will co continue to appreciate and, and a certain measure of stability will return to the markets. Right. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> Number one. Can I? Yes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Hicks, can you tell us what uh, uh, the tax freeze has done to property values and assessment in the Cab County and maybe what a continued tax assessment freeze would do to our tax digest? Okay, now which tax freeze are to the one that is supposed to sunset? Uh, I think we did it in 2000, I think it was. Frozen value. Right, frozen value. Yes. Basically, that, that's referred to as a value offset exemption. Mm -hmm. uh, as a value increases above your floor, mm -hmm. you have an exemption that sort of comes in, fills, fills right. that void, and says it, it reduces your value back down to whatever it was. Uh, I don't have the numbers specifically in terms of, of the, the negative impact mm -hmm. from the standpoint of revenue generation that, 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 that occurs, but I, I, I can see that it would be significant. It's, it's rather difficult to, uh, to uh, change that number. Uh, I had my first appeal mm -hmm. uh, from someone who wanted to object to the frozen value base. Mm -hmm. Uh, just just this year, and, and um, right. that that was that was new. Uh, it, it, it can change. That mm -hmm. that that base can change based on um, value. Or if, if you are making renovations, the same same almost mm -hmm. the same criteria. Mm -hmm. If you're making renovations to that property, your your, your frozen value base can change. Uh, but in most instances, that has it against and say it, it, it doesn't. So you, you end up with some some uh, relatively stagnant values. Mm -hmm. that, that, that applies only to mm -hmm. the the county component of, right. of, of the mill rate. Uh, but in terms of a specific number, I don't have that uh, with regard to how much revenue has been for, foregone because of its its uh, application. Okay. Uh, but but I would imagine it is significant. Madam Chair, I just wanted to bring that up because they're uh, looking for an extension of that right now mm -hmm. down to the General Assembly. And I think it's significant. I can't tell you the number, but years ago it was in the millions of dollars that uh, caused us some uh, problems in our digest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when, when you consider uh, we have approximately 145,000 homesteaded properties, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's going to be significant. Right. Uh, I don't know what the number is, but it's okay, who's I'm not sure right now who it is. I'll find out again. Mm -hmm. So we are, uh, Mr. Williams, we are following you. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a question since that impacts unincorporated the cab and the city, when you said something that was key, it caught my attention. Can the city still do something to raise their rates or millage rates to offset? Because it impacts the county unincorporated a whole great deal. How does it, it, it is going to impact these cities that are being formed? Well, not all of them. This fellowship is actually offering an exemption. Okay. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and, and some of them is only the constitutional exemption, and uh, I'll ask to be corrected. So if we offer that and they get it from the, the county, but the cities don't offer it, so they get the full value or rate? That's correct. So they don't, so can we propose a city homestead exemption? I'm just trying to find a way to, I don't know, I'm just trying to see how it impacts. It impacts the county wide greatly, mm -hmm. but the new cities and all those are getting formed. I just want to see how it, how those citizens who live in those cities can reap some of the benefits of the discount of the freeze that we have to undertake and unincorporate the cab. You can't answer that question. No, no I can't, and, and yeah. you, you're correct. The, the, the homestead exemption would impact everything in the county. Mm -hmm. whether it's unincorporated right. uh, this, or incorporated. Sorry, However, I'm when, when the municipalities are, are viewing that, not all of those municipalities have the same exemption the level that the county does. Okay. Are there any other questions? No, I just want to, uh, no, I think Mr. Hicks did a good job in just showing, I think the point to, to all this is when we're looking at 
assumptions about revenues. Of course, it goes the lion's share of our funding come, is generated from what our tax digest ultimately will be certified uh, at. And of course, we don't get that clear picture until it's certified in, in the, uh, for us at mid-year. Um, but I wanted this conversation because we just haven't had that at a substantive level in terms of what's out there on the street, what you know, uh, what is being seen, and what are some of the impacts on on where we are, uh, where we need to be. Uh, and um, so, of course, the way that our budget year is settled, and we all know this is, you know, we approve this budget. Uh, you all approve this budget. And it's basically an assumption budget until we get to the actual certified mm -hmm. digest because such a large chunk of our revenues won't be certified until, uh, until that happens. So I just want y'all to see that and that there's some really a, uh, some light at the end of the tunnel. I think, you know, we've been talking about the economy turning around, um, but I think you can see that reflected in here. Zillow com isn't a county-based thing. It's an independent index. We've all talked about looking at uh, other kind of indexes. You know, we ask the administration time and time again, let's look at what other things uh, are going on. I just got an email of um, the K. Schiller index um, looking at the United States prices increasing about 11.3% in the fourth quarter um, compared to a year earlier. Mm -hmm. And again, these are all anecdotal kind of things, but it just lets you know that um, the kind of the, 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 the uh, direction that we're headed. We can't say substantively that it would be one, two, three, five, six percent, mm -hmm. but we can say we are headed in the positive, you know, range. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, and actually, it's for departments because we're really, yeah. I, I invited them just in case, so okay. you want to. State that to the chair. I'm sorry, um, Madam Chair, I, I had invited a number of department heads, but I think we can. I think we're at our maximum. Right, so we can accomplish the same thing by me providing you what's going to be coming in a few minutes in writing. So if, if they're not needed, we can probably clear the room of a number of them. And, you know. okay. All right, so you, the two people that we want to, uh, or the two areas that we want to come forward, will be the police and fire. Uh, if y'all could come up and uh, sit up and take one of the things in this conversation, just letting y'all know that I want to make sure that I have heard y'all clear uh, about the amended budget that we put forward. Uh, that that I put forward. Um, there's some concerns out there about what the ultimately ultimate uh, revenue projection uh, will look like. And so the expenditure the area is, what, what is, is what called some in concerns and anxiety. Uh, 1%. 1%. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're going to be, you know, looking at uh, where we are and, and, uh, and seeing if we can come up with some uh, a compromise in terms of realizing some of the priorities that we want to put forward, but also identifying some of the concerns that the board members have done. But two areas I wanted to make sure that we highlighted again is in public safety. We've all talked about that being priority number one, and making sure that we're having the funding available uh, to, uh, to accomplish uh, some of our goals. So we brought the, the police chief and the new fire chief y'all just Let's met today. He's a uh, trial by fire here. So, you know, I, I, I told him there's no better way to, you know, get ready than just be thrown in. So he's being thrown in now. Um, we have, um, um, our, who has been our interim chief, uh, uh, Augustine, here as well. He'll be helping to, to, to chime in uh, where it's needed. And he's, he did a wonderful job uh, filling the gap for us uh, while we were doing the search. So we're going to start with the uh, Chief Conroy from police and then jump in the fire and then and we'll keep this as short as possible. Just as because we're just like overcrowded and it's really, I mean, distracting and overwhelming to us because we're trying to focus. Can we just like even let our conference room be used as an overflow room? I just don't need a zillion people to stand here on the room. Okay, we're going to set up an overflow room in the uh, legislative conference room. Uh, for your comfort, I'm asking everyone who's standing to please go in there. I think when Charles get a did, department, mm -hmm. department mm -hmm. heads. Just get the department mm -hmm. heads. Mm -hmm. Maybe everyone else can sit down. That would be helpful. Could we just have everybody sit down? It would be very helpful. 
Jeff will come in in a minute. Yeah, don't take that away. Commissioner Rainer is going to be here in a minute just to be, I'm sorry to say, as we reshuffle the room. Didn't it get cooler in here all the time? It did. That's the doors. <laughs> because the doors are not blocked any yes. further. <laughs> Okay, we'll give them a moment to uh, set up in there. Um, okay. Well, we might have some civilians in there. We don't want. No, no, civilians. no civilians don't go in there. Okay. No civilians. But thank you, our chief clerk, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Okay. I'll be brief because I know you've got a full schedule. But um, first, I want to say um, how encouraged I am. The level of cooperation that I see between the Board of Commissioners and the CEO's office as it relates to public safety is something I haven't seen in my years involved in the police administration. But well, thank you. We're yeah, proud that's of great. Right. Thank, thank you. you. I think, I think we're, we're finally that. heading in the right direction. <laughs> um, of course, uh, we're familiar. We've had meetings, several meetings, about our strategic plans and our strategic enhancements. And some of our concerns and our three big areas of concerns of course are personnel equipment and facilities and we've submitted uh, several strategic plans to you that encompass addressing all of these issues and some of our most immediate goals of course is personnel our attrition rate has been deplorable over the past several years and getting worse as we proceed one of the problems in the police department is if you tell me today I can hire a police officer it's one year once we complete the background, the application process, the six-month police academy, two-month field training before they're on the road and a viable uh, employee for us. Mm -hmm. So one year from now, so we're working behind. And as you know, several months ago, we had a problem where we were not even accepting applications. So um, you guys gave approval for us to prime the pump, so to speak. We began accepting applications and began an aggressive hiring process. Uh, and the plan included 160 police officers each year for the next three years. And what that does, that addresses our attrition rate, and we are capped by um, uh, constraints for training. Uh, we only have so many trainers and so, so many training classrooms where we can conduct training. So we felt 160 is a very reasonable number and will help stem our losses. Uh, we're also addressing the attrition rate. Uh, last year we lost 123 sworn officers. And I am proud to report uh, at the direction of Commissioner Johnson started a 3% bonus, and I know it was approved by the Board of Commissioners in conjunction with the CEO. Our December attrition rate, so we were averaging 11 and a half officers per month. In December we only lost three. January we only lost five. So that attrition rate is decreasing and that's part of our factor hopefully getting up to our allocated strength in three years so we, we are making some great headways in that um, a part of that plan also was the take-home vehicle program and we uh, submitted an original plan and also some amendments to that and part of that plan was um, we had two years where we did not buy any police vehicles at all so our fleet was increasingly becoming older um, in the old days 90,000 miles was the cap out mm -hmm. <clears throat> when we hit 90,000 miles we sold the vehicle that raised up to a hundred now we've got many vehicles out there over 160 to 175,000 miles on them that are being driven that's driving miles you got to remember these officers sit in the vehicles for 24 hours a day so the engine time is, is compounded upon that so some of the things we've done they've shifted to the new Chevy Caprice vehicle um, we just got the decals approved this morning thank you very much so we'll get uh, many of those vehicles decal but one of the problems with the chevy caprice they no longer make the crown victoria so our equipment from the crown victoria does not translate into the caprice but we did find a good solution for that um, we've been experimenting with uh, greg Brake from fleet i saw him here i guess he went to the other room <laughs> we're, we're, infrastructure we're, was banned <laughs> That's right. I'll tell them later. That yeah. Up. But he's helping us. Uh, we learned about a program the city of Atlanta was doing, refurbishing these Crown Victorias. For fifteen thousand dollars, they strip them out: engines, transmissions, uh, struts, suspension, everything, inside and out. Bring it in, and it's just like driving a brand new vehicle. Plus, we get to reuse some of that old equipment that still fits in there: light bars and the, the uh, prisoner screens. So. 
Uh, we changed it from 100 additional vehicles to 50 and then 50 refurbs, and that's going to help us catch up in the vehicles that we have not replaced over the past few years, as well as helping with this program. Um, I'm kind of going off base, so I wanted to leave a couple minutes if there were some additional questions that you had. I just want oh. to make sure that we highlight everything that was in your budget so that all the commissioners have an understanding of it. This is kind of the day where commissioners okay. come and listen to the details. So. Okay. And I, I think we've hit all of the high items, um, but I did want to uh, hit some numbers so, so you know where we are. Our authorized strength is... Chief, not to interrupt you, but no. if you want to give him a compliment, okay. he's right there. Great. Um, <laughs> they brought you back. We, we were discussing the uh, refurbished Crown Vic program okay. and uh, some of the success that we had. And I gave you kudos right. for helping us out with that. Was, is there anything I explain how we're reusing some of the equipment? And at $15,000, we're refurbing it. It's almost like driving a brand new vehicle. So I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add. Well, I would just say it's a really cost beneficial to refurb these because these units typically cost about the unit itself costs about $25,000 to $28,000. Well, actually, replacement now is $28,000, $29,000. And then you typically have to buy equipment for them. And, and the equipment costs are as much as the car. So the refurb program. You get to save up the cost of all that equipment just about. I mean, you do have to re decal them. And the refurb unit is actually, we're bringing it in as a new unit. And uh, they look great. I mean, they got a new engine, transmission, the whole driveline suspension, the interior is doctored up, nice new paint job. So when you look at them, they look like a new Crown Vic. So uh, we expect that to you know, give us great rewards. We have a three-year warranty with them, just like a new vehicle. So um, it's a win-win. Like the trash cans. <laughs> we were saying, uh, Mr. CEO, maybe you can bring one for us to look at, kind of like the trash cans. We can yeah, poke it and get the tire. Take us for a ride. Can I give great kudos? Uh, we gave uh, my police and fire just major kudos during the ice storm. But this gentleman right here is the one that kept everyone Fleet rolling. Movement. I yes. went by during the ice storm and there's number one, if you've never done a tour of the fleet maintenance shop, it's if we could make that a for profit venture, you know, we I mean really we would out, we would beat everyone. But mm -hmm. but they were That's we had people working twenty four hour shifts, not just the twelve, sixteen and uh, and so they did a phenomenal job over there. So I just wanna throw that in. Thank you. When you came by I was actually out of Kroger buying groceries for these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Let's tell everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so the CEO wanted me to we'll touch base on where we are at our staffing levels mm -hmm. and where we are for the year. So, um, and I'm not going to get into the funded versus unfunded. That's just too too complex. But authorized, we we're authorized of sworn personnel, 1,113 positions. Uh, currently, we have 918 filled. This does include the uh, the fifth. What is that, please? 1,113 authorized, 918 filled sworn only and that that fill does include the 50 that we have in the police academy it today. does and that leaves us with a vacancy of 195. so our plan for the year of that 160 and let me add there's 10 to that but that was from the cops grant because we had to have 10 additional for the cops grant mm -hmm. that's factored into the authorized total mm -hmm. so of the 160 it's really 170 that we were going to hire this year we've already hired 80 out of this 170 so we've got 90 more to hire for the remainder of the year and we've slated that spread that over three police academies starting in March July and November of 30 recruits each yes sir Commissioner Jones I was I want to ask a question before I get up so the 160 is not is in, it's included in the 195 vacancies correct so okay yes the other question was part of the dilemma that we had over the years that that made not only just for officers and firefighters but it's for all the staff was to look at to have HR look at how we do steps because it seemed like you top out at a certain level so there's no incentive for you to keep trying to rise because your salary is topped out part of I'm thinking the see as we work forward we have to look at the steps in between so we can have merit based yeah, but where people since, can look at how they can get increases instead of just waiting on this boom one time yeah, or this salary increase we do every seven years but if we could just feed money in there steadily mm -hmm. you can give people an incentive on why mm -hmm. i want to be 
lieutenant or move up to all different levels. Have we ever remedied that or is that still on the table? Because that was always that a problem like that the county right. didn't. We always topped out, so <coughs> once you reach a certain level, it. there was no oh, incentive yeah. for you to try to like keep doing more to, to move up. And they, did we remedy that for the officers? I, I can speak briefly to the police department. So okay. when you're hired as a police officer, you're a police officer one. Right. Then after one year, you're mm -hmm. off probation, you make police officer two. Okay. So in the old days, you got 5%, and then in six months, you got 5%. Right. And that was removed several years ago. Is that what we did for all employees at one time? Uh, all employees no, we got did it for police in 08. Okay. And then the other part was the step I guess we took it thing. Where I think that's all of them. I wish I had HR in the room. But part of it is looking at how we do mm -hmm. the steps we did where we, we reached a certain level where you didn't even, you couldn't even qualify for or you, get another you hit your raise. Ceiling. You hit your right. ceiling. And I believe and in 2009. Years and you sitting at the same level. Yeah, maybe yes, 2009 or 10, we raised the top end mm -hmm. for captains and below. Right. Right. I remember we did that. Yeah. We do have HR. But that, that does create other issues. HR. Yeah. Right. I'm right. just trying to make a uniform for everybody. Yes. yes. I've just been for the HRs and then they couldn't actually answer it. When the last one? Yes, sir. Were you talking about step 56? I don't know. I don't know the numbers. I don't know all of that. I just know that when you reach a certain level, yeah, it's still it doesn't go big long. It does go 57, 58, 58B, 59C. To get rid of steps and actually go to a band so that there can be more movement within the range. But as of right now, we, mm. we max out at step 56. If your classification stops there, there's nothing we can do. But hopefully, the band class study will address that. And um, it's kind of outdated. But okay. we're looking to move forward to the band so people can move forward with the classification and not keep them or penalize them for maxing out that step. Because mm. even by doing the raises or whatever we decide to do, we still have that that um, the infant system in place mm -hmm. that you you're still stuck. Yeah. So until we address the whole, that's why Commissioner Board talked about the paying class. Mm -hmm. That's going to be well, very right. instrumental that we can have some structure so people can have something to look forward to as they try to advance in their career and stay here as opposed to okay I've topped out here so I'm just going to you know that. early retiree I'm just going to stay in the job I can't get nothing else so why why should I do anything extra so that's not thought about that because I know we did yours we tweaked yours yes but it's, uh, all it was was a tweak but we didn't look at the overall uh, uniformity of the system for all employees and I think that's something that will help us as we look at uh, increases or uh, realign the organization to get the right the, the skill set as well. So to summarize, Mr. CEO, that is being addressed. In, in the paying pay class study, okay. absolutely. And, and here's the thing, the goal is to not have to do these one-time shots for 3% uh, yeah. increases here. Yeah. Our compensation policy and program should reflect fair compensation and built-in increases based upon performance and kind of where you are with that within that band if we're going to move away from the whole steps, you know, kind of thing to more fluidity within kind of the range and I think that can that can address that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that and that policy is in place to address that in HR. So this is something that's holistically being addressed. Right. And will be reported back to the board. That's right. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, uh, thank you, Chief Conroy. You I think one of the things we in Earth we had come up with something uh, with the previous chief uh, to help stem the uh, attrition rate, I guess, for us on the police officers. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, for Ertz, I, I don't know where we have that in the but you may want to share that with him, with Chief Conroy. The three of us that came up with some ideas to help, I think, the take home card, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to revisit that with our Earth okay. Chairman at some point. The second question, if I can, Madam uh, Chairwoman, is that you mentioned equipment, you only talked about cars. Is there anything that you can say that's uh, deficient as well? I mean, in, in public, or you need to take us offline. We don't want everybody to know. <laughs> yes, um, uh, in public, uh, part of our strategic enhancements included uh, technology. Okay. Um, we've fallen heavily behind in technology. Mm -hmm. Technology is very expensive, as you know. Uh, today, we had, we uh, addressed the thing of the um, ruggedized laptops, laptops and vehicles. So that was one step in the direction. We're already working with IT on some wireless sure. connectivity to try and get away from some of these air cards in the vehicles. Right. And instead of everybody having to have an air card, we're trying to do some hot spots at the precincts and fire stations so our officers can upload from there. And so technology's in here, and it was more towards the second equipment. or third okay. year of the plan. Okay. And lastly, you mentioned facility, but you didn't go into detail. Yes. Um, some of the, the key facilities that we're talking about, of course, our training facility. Sure. 
Um, I think many of you have seen our training facility and the, the condition it's in. And it's also co-located with our East Precinct. Right. So we're looking at both of those facilities. Um, either moving to different locations, we're looking around the Stonecrest area okay. uh, for, for East Precinct as well as a training facility in those locations. We did have an additional one, which is our Special Operations Division. Right now they're housed in the Burgess Building, <laughs> and we're looking to uh, build a hangar facility. It's a hangar and a headquarters for Special Ops right there off of Camp Circle. Okay. Um, uh, we're working with uh, facilities right now on that plan, and that one would be purchased with CFI. Okay, what would that be? <laughs> um, are you familiar with, we have a location where we fuel the helicopter, we fly it off of the building and land to fuel it, it would be right there at the fuel pad. Would it be visible from 285? No, no, it's a, it's a two-story hangar, mm -hmm. small facility. It, get, it also gets the helicopter in from the, the elements. Um, an example, during the snowstorm, we had to fly the helicopter up to Tacoa which was the only place we could have a covered facility so it wouldn't be damaged in the storm. Mm -hmm. And this would give us a covered facility here in DeKalb. So once it cleared up, we could bring the bird without having a driveway out and fly all the way back in. Okay. So um, I thought, that, I know this is um, from the budget, but at some point we were talking about moving the helicopter so it wouldn't be sitting on top of the Bobby Burgess building. Correct, and that's the, uh, the plan with the hangar. Okay. Yes. So we weren't talking about flying it over to Shannon? No, uh, we, we previously had a spot at PDK where we could house it, mm -hmm. um, and one of the plans, I think you're, you're thinking the plan when we were going to house North Precinct at the airport location, mm -hmm. and we were going to establish a pad behind it. We had some challenges with the airport, you have to get clearance every time before it leaves, mm -hmm. um, plus we're no longer moving, we did not move the North Precinct to that location. Okay. It would be great as things change that you would, you know, bring a report back to us, and I, I'm not saying you personally, but if we could establish uh, a routine in that, in that we do that, because that's something we talked oh, about months ago, <laughs> and when the plans changed, it was never a report brought, brought back to us. And I'd be happy to do that. Okay. I'm happy Mr. Do. Williams, I guess that will fall on you anyway. That's right. So. We'll find a way to make sure that that happens. Okay. okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mr. CEO? No, no. Just throwing on over to the new fire chief <laughs> and uh you know i'll say one thing about the fire chief even when he interviewed he had done his homework and research on the department i mean knew some of the details about you know what what our thoughts were and everything so in terms of where we are it's not completely forward to him but um but i was just happy to to to, to, to see that he had taken that much uh, I interest in what we were doing already. So, people. Well, CEO, you really put me on the spot mm -hmm. for my knowledge. But uh, welcome to the cab. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, and I will say that through that research, um, and I'll echo what the, the uh, police chief said, that I do find um, a lot of support for public safety. So that was something that made this job exciting to me. So I appreciate that as well. I'll start off with the numbers. Uh, we're showing 743 authorized positions. Uh, right now we have 634 filled. Uh, that leaves a vacant number of 109. Uh, we had nine uh, that uh, left the department this year so far. Uh, we did graduate a class uh, on Friday of 11 firefighters, and that is included in 634. So uh, we too are looking to hire this year. Uh, I've already been in conversation with Human Resources about getting an announcement out so that we can get a register. And uh, our goal is to have two classes, one in spring and one in fall. Uh, so be an average of about 50 firefighters per class. Uh, one item that I did uh, note very quickly and there was some work already being done on it is the fire marshal's office and uh, through the uh, budget process um, there was four positions that were being uh, requested two of those positions would be plan reviewers and uh, what we would be attempting to do with those two new plan reviewers is first to clear the uh, backlog we do have several plans uh, that, let's see, about 148 that we're considering to be backlogged. 
Uh, we think with those two plan reviewers, the first thing we'll do is the first priority will be to clear those plans. And then uh, each plan reviewer will be able to do approximately 70 plan reviews a month. And that's just using historical data of what the ones are doing now. There's uh, three. So we believe after clearing those uh, backlog plans that we will have enough capacity to handle the volume that comes in. Right now we're getting in approximately 320 plans per month. And just using the numbers of the other plan reviewers will be up to 350 that we should be able to handle. Uh, so we're happy to hear that those, um, those positions uh, could possibly be approved through the, the budget. And I uh, think that that would be part of handling uh, some of the concerns in the fire marshal's office. Um, I'll, uh, we do have uh, Cap, or, excuse me, Chief Augustine here who can help me, but I do know that one of the items that we did have in the strategic enhancement was some of our stations that needed to be uh, remodeled. So I'll let you speak to those because I don't remember the exact one. Okay, but there before we continue, yes. uh, Commissioner Boyd, you have questions? Just about the fire marshals. And when we do have our individual conversations with you, Chief, that is something in, in my office has been a point of contention. Okay. So, um, and I understand the numbers you just read. I'd like to have further discussion about that because sure. there could be some ideas just from us working with some of the groups that may help facilitate faster. Mm -hmm. That just needs to be um, a higher level of productivity in that department. Yes. So I'm gonna support the positions, but the outcomes are the things that I'm concerned about. Please continue. Uh, as it relates to the, the fire stations, we have about five fire stations that are in need of repair. Um, station three in Avondale is included in that. And last, not last meeting, the meeting before that, that, that station was approved. So we're going to start working on, on rebuilding that station. And I've been in conversation with Chris um, Morrison to see if we can uh, get more funds to start working on the others. So that's that's one of our major parts of uh, Darryl, our budget is going Darryl forward. Road one of I'm sorry. Daryl. Oh, board. definitely. Station seven. Yes, that's actually the one we talked about. It's going to be next. And what are the options yeah, that that's are what we need to station, help. station fourteen, is which is on that? Covington Highway, mm -hmm. and um, station like shack. <laughs> station sixteen is on Snapfinger Woods Drive. That one needs to be repaired. Those are the ones that are really. It needs to be repaired right away. Okay. Rebuilt, not repaired. Rebuilt. Rebuilt. So do? all three of these things you need to build Coming from the finger. Rebuilt. Yeah, oh. I misspoke. Rebuilt. Okay. Hmm. Right. Have you got a evaluation of the entire uh, system of um, stations? Yes, we're actually in the process with our um, administrative and logistics um, mm -hmm. division. Chief Smith, Chief Garrett Smith, he's actually working to, to do an evaluation of all the stations. When will that be done? I can't speak for him, but I would say no more than a month. He's been working on it for about two months. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see that, you know, Maybe comprehensive bring it to list. Mm -hmm. Ask him to bring it to cops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no. it's been requested it. that that report be brought to cops. Got it. Okay. And I'll add to that, um, I don't know what the uh, requirements were for that, that review, but one of the areas, especially with fire stations, we do have 42 females that are on the fire department now, but it's just not a question of gender, but there is an issue of privacy and safety in fire stations. So we'll include that as well, just not replacing the physical footprint of the building, but the interior, making sure that, that it accommodates the fire department. Okay, so just to kind of uh, wrap up, uh, you've heard the uh, authorized fields and vacant numbers. Um, so when you hear, uh, in fire, the uh, hiring of 100 uh, new firefighters uh, each year and 160 in police. That number really came um, uh, about uh, by looking at the uh, attrition levels. So if you take the, uh, on average in police, it had been about 100 or so. Last year was an uptick at that 120 uh, level. But if, if we were to stick with that average of 100 a year, uh, and then we hire in 160, then we're nowhere 
we're adding about 60 new to our net uh, net gain to ultimately uh, close that that vacancy list 195 in, in police and 109 in that so if you look at that now the goal in addition to what we were looking before and I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this but uh, the the take-home car program the tuition reimbursement program the uh, the bonuses and 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 the uh, hopefully uh, at some time in the uh, near future uh, the uh, the additional needs of the uh, the facilities and equipment as well that will begin to uh, lower that retention level so that we can get to our ultimate goal of uh, filling all of our authorized positions and you know if we can keep up the numbers that that Conroy just put forward uh, what five four left in uh, December and five left in Jen? Three in December, five in Jen. Okay, if we can keep up numbers like that, then we'll get to closing that gap between the field and, and authorized positions sooner than later. And uh, and ultimately, that'll be a cost savings to all of us uh, as we move forward. So I just wanted to bring them between Calvin and public safety, kind of looking at the revenues and looking at what we've all said, uh, I think we can all agree upon is, is public safety and making sure that they have what they need uh, to move uh, the county forward. Uh, and just kind of closing up on all of this, I just want to reiterate the fact that I've heard you all, uh, your concerns about spending uh, and about the uh, getting some greater certainty in terms of the tax digest and all of that. Uh, what I put forward was a budget that reflect the priorities that I believe were important for moving the county forward. Uh, but this, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, me sitting down in this seat with the board of commissioners, with your leadership, I think it was critical for me to hear what you all wanted to see and then work it out. You know, and so we're in the midst of that workout, you know, now uh, to getting something that's more reflective of what I've heard. That's why I was a stickler of saying either tell me personally or email to me kind of what you would like to see and some of the concerns that you have. And the goal is to get back over the next day and a half um, the, uh, uh, a budget that you all can look at and say, okay, I see what you have, Commissioner. Uh, or Lee, and uh, these are ours, you know, kind of uh, in, in as much of a consensus as we can build from the board's perspective that we can move forward. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any more questions <coughs> before Mr. Board? It's not really a question, it's going back to the same thing I keep harping on, and that's the millage for the police. Mm -hmm. You know, in putting together, which I think we have now very good leadership in both departments. Um, is the ability for us to take whatever five-year plan they come up with and it has to do with facilities you know equipment and so forth and be able to take that to the public mm -hmm. i truly believe that if the public saw ironclad plans and that you talk to them about it they would support it even if it meant an uptick in a millage we actually did this a number of years ago in fire when we built station i think it's 25 and we had some other things we had to do as years ago. Um, and we t ticked the fire millage up just a tiny bit, maybe it was a quarter, maybe it was a quarter and a half, I don't remember what it was. But then the next year we lowered it because we were able to justify that for the capital improvements that we did. So by that, that's really what I would like to see. But the police millage has to be straightened out. Mm -hmm. I mean, we right. actually, Lee, right. you and yeah. I went exactly. down there and a lot of time, yeah. mm -hmm. spent a lot of time and energy into it, and it's still not actually correct. But if we could figure out whatever resolution, I know we talked about it at the last meeting, mm -hmm. to straighten it out. I just can't let that go. Right. And I'm not going no, to. No, I know. I'm not. We, like it's said, not our fault, but we line. did try. We just got to figure out how to fix it. Because the public wants to see the transparency of that, and they would support a plan that we were able to take to them so i keep saying that and you know mm -hmm. hopefully i'll get it done well, i think we're moving in the right direction to, mm -hmm. to to realize the spirit of what we what we passed you know uh, before but i think and, we and need further legislation don't we well yeah i, I do think so that's um, what i think we do yes. we're gonna have to take it and yeah. get it done we got some critical legislation right now we need to deal with uh, but <laughs> But, uh, but no, I agree. Uh, and I think we should look at that as a part of a further legislative plan. And I do agree that if we can show these plans more robustly to the public, that because when you talk about an uptick in the military rate, that doesn't necessarily mean translate into an uptick in overall military rate. No, I'm talking it about may say we can adjust course. within, you know, or there may be even a case to adjust as a whole, but at least we got a plan 
that's been we did it specifically in the fire fund thank you even though is there any more discussion thank you very much thank you Is there any other uh, area that you would like to address today? No. We're just working. We're still hammering out the uh, 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 fix that we think is on what I've, all of I've heard mm -hmm. um, that that would be something that you all could support and, uh, and approve on get, Thursday. So when do we get that? We're working on it. We're working on it as you know, has everybody as given you their I know I've given you mine either thoughts. verbally or um, or in writing I think uh, Zach, you've been talking to Zach yeah so Zach and I have talked about that okay. Jeff and I have written and we've, we've had a conversation when with do we more get today. to see this and uh, so I think everyone has morning, I guess. I think we're still cooking. has done that can't get it to us today no, I don't think today. I don't want to make that commitment today, but over the next, uh, mm -hmm. almost well, tomorrow's Wednesday, so really, mm -hmm. on Wednesday and the Thursday, I'll give you enough time to look at it and, mm -hmm. and adjust. Because again, the goal is to make sure that finance can make their ultimate adjustments, because that's what we're really you know, looking at. So I can talk in broad strokes, but you know, in terms of the details, I mean, the devil's in the details. That's right. So Just in order to be These able details. to review, do you have some sort of an idea of what time tomorrow? Um, before noon or afternoon? Afternoon tomorrow? Let's say afternoon. Let's say um, five o'clock. <laughs> it might be before, but let's just say afternoon. Uh, let's say about three o'clock. Okay. okay. Can we do? Well, I, I'm saying three o'clock. Right. We're gonna, I'm we're gonna go three, back and keep let's working. Talk about That's what, mm -hmm. When can we get the budget changed? How quickly can we get the adjustments that we've been discussing, kind of in a form that they can look at and see? Three o'clock tomorrow will be a good time. Okay. okay. There are lots of moving parts. Mm -hmm. and you have to, I have to be sure that it balances. Mm -hmm. right. And so you all have to give me that opportunity to do it with my big budget. <laughs> because one, let me say, I've learned more now having in terms of that. Because, you know, the thing that we would say is that it's an easy fix. Just move this money over here. And, and this one right here. The great Dr. Gwen happen. has let me know that it doesn't just it doesn't work that when we make one adjustment here, there's a cascading effect mm -hmm. in many respects. That's why I changed my major. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Anyway, okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. We're not addressing any purchasing items today. Either. I don't believe that. Okay, so if there's nothing else that anybody wants to discuss, I'd like to make an emergency adjournment. There's 40 positions for the interview. And they're going to use them to take care of the back. That's the first order of business. But then they're going to keep on and how many do they have now?